source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. Our investigation takes place in Oromocto, a small community in New Brunswick, on a river by the same name. It's located 20 kilometers from the provincial capital of Fredericton. In fact, Oromocto is an Aboriginal word meaning deep water. It is a quiet, clean, and peaceful place where violent crime is rare. The deep frozen waters of the Oromocto River hide a secret. But as the warmth of spring approaches, the high water level will subside to reveal the mystery that the river was intended to hide. On Saturday, April 13th, 1991, a call is received by the Oromocto RCMP. It's Gail Bischoff, and she says that her 14-year-old daughter, Pamela, has not returned home since the night before. Constable Gilles Blin arrives for a shift and sees the report about a missing person. I went to see uh, Mrs. Bischoff uh, later in the afternoon, off the 13th of uh, April 1991. Um, she was distraught. Uh, she told me that her daughter hadn't made it home that morning or that night, and that was very unusual, that uh, Pamela always made it home, and there was no reason for her not to be home. She told me that uh, they had made inquiries in the morning to try to locate her, and uh, they had no success with that. And that's why she reported it to the police later on in the afternoon. There was indication that a group of youths were, uh, had a gathering the night before, and there was a party at the train bridge. It wasn't uncommon for youths to gather down there and have parties. It's, it's away from where, where adults could find them. The railway bridge crosses the Oromocto River at the northwest end of the city. In early April, the water level is high from the melting snow. There was a group of them drinking and, and doing whatever youths do at the time. And then on their way back, it was early in the evening, say 9, 10 o'clock, the main group went one direction and Pam and Billy stayed behind, and that's the last they were seen. According to information gathered by the Bischoff family, a 17-year-old named Billy Stillman was the last person to be seen with Pamela. As far as I know, all the kids that were there that night, the night of April 12th, all knew each other. They were acquaintances or friends. The only oddball to the group was Billy Stillman, according to the witnesses that we spoke to. They knew him, but that was it. Pamela's sister phoned Stillman that morning. Gail's daughter, the other daughter, called Billy's house and spoke to Billy and said, Billy, have you seen Pam? And Billy says to Jennifer, says, why, is she missing? So I, I, that was super odd. You, you wouldn't expect a response like that. Pamela's mother tells Constable Blinn what her daughter was wearing when she left the house the previous evening. She was wearing a black jacket, white blouse with stripes on there and black jeans and uh, white sneakers. Her mother said that she had a, um, an underwear set, panties and bra that were pink with black polka dots on there. Gilles Blin collects all the information that the family can provide. One shocking statement made by Pamela's mother sticks in his mind. She says, my daughter is dead. Billy Stillman raped her killed her and threw her in the Ormokta River. And she looked at me square in my eyes. I can't describe the feeling to you. You'd have to be there to see it. It is bone chilling to experience something like that. And of course, 
I, I said to her, you know, we're going to try our best to find her and, and hopefully we won't have those results. And I tried to uh, console her the best I could. And I called my staff sergeant at the time and I said, this is what I have. And he said, look, maybe you should wait, you know, because it does cost money on weekends and resources and so on. I said, well, you know, I got this feeling too. He says, do whatever you think you have to do. Every case is different. You can have people that go missing a lot, and you do it all the time. They're habitual runaways. But you gotta weigh every case differently. People think that you have to wait 24 hours before you report someone missing, that's not true. If, if, if there's a 14-year-old that goes missing and it's, it's, it's out of the ordinary, they have to report it right away and, and we'll look at it right away. Jill Blinn and a team of officers begin to search the area for the young girl. Uh, we had to start speaking with people, friends that were last seen with her, and that's what I did. I started looking for her, speaking with people that saw her last, and every indication was, look, we saw Billy with her, and she was last seen with her at, at Deer Park, and they went their separate ways, and that's all we knew. From the beginning, uh, Billy Stillman was last seen with Pamela Bischoff, so on a police point of view, he'd be a person of interest. The next day, Constable Blinn goes to talk to Billy Stillman. The interview ends after only a few minutes. He didn't seem distraught or anything like that or, or nervous. He gave me the same story as before that he, he parted ways with her uh, not too far from Deer Park, and, and that was the last he had seen of her. Later that day, the search for the young girl intensifies. We released her picture to the media. We wanted some information from the public, you know, asking to see if they had located her to give us a call. But then when you do that, you have people calling from everywhere with sightings that are not really sightings, and you have to investigate every one of them. We, we kept looking for her. We had the dogs out there, the RCMP dogs. We had the, the RCMP helicopter looking, searching around Deer Park. We also had the boat on the river that very weekend, the RCMP boat searching the river for any evidence that we could find, and of course, none was found. Typically, again, they show up within 48 hours, they're back home and everything's good. There was just something about this case that just didn't make sense to me. Police question some of Stillman's friends for clues. They say he returned around midnight on Friday with scratches on his face. His clothes were wet and stained with blood. Stillman immediately put his clothes in the washing machine and then had a two-hour bath. Gilles Blinn finds Stillman's behavior suspicious and decides to question him once again. This time, he tries to shock Stillman by confronting him with the statements that Pamela's mother had made. Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I went and I was going to take a, a, an on-paper, what we call a statement, from him. I can still recall this as it happened yesterday. I'm in uniform, looked at him right in the eye, and I said to him, I said, Billy, I know what you did. I said, you took Pam down by the river, you raped her, you killed her, and you threw her, you threw her in the river, didn't you? And I'm a police officer in full uniform, and he was a 17-year-old kid, and that kid never batted an eye. He never took a gulp, he never turned red, he never fainted, no sign of anything that I would deem suspicious at the time. If Billy Stillman is telling the truth, is it still possible that Pamela ran away and will reappear one day? Gilles Blinn wants to be sure to get all the details from the young man. I took him over to the police station in Oromocto, and I took a witness statement from him. So he explained to me why he was scratched up and all that. And he gave me a nice statement saying that he was, uh, he, he had crossed the highway and uh, there was a carload of aboriginals, and it was five of them, and beat him up. And then he made his way home, and that's why he was all scratched up and so on. I never got beat up by five people, but if I got beat up by five people, I don't think I could walk. So that story didn't make any sense. What really happened the night of April 12th? 
Did Stillman destroy crucial evidence when he washed his clothes? Pamela Bishop disappeared on Friday, April 12, 1991. She was partying with a group of friends near the Oromocto River in New Brunswick. All the witnesses claim that Billy Stillman is the last person to be seen with the young girl. Is Pamela a simple runaway, or has she fallen victim to foul play? The whole community is on alert, and the media spreads the news of her disappearance well beyond the small town. Monday, April 15th, Jill Blinn, the officer in charge of the investigation, receives a call from Halifax. Leonardo Caldi, a civilian dog handler, offers to bring his search and rescue dogs to help locate the missing girl. All I said is, we're done our search. If you want to come up, you go ahead. Blinn was a bit skeptical since the RCMP dogs had already searched the areas that the witnesses described, and they found nothing. I could have said, no, this is our turf. We don't belong here. We have our own resources. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll handle it. But I'm an open-minded guy. I said, you know what, if you want to come search, my theory is the more hands, the better. I showed them where uh, Pamela Bischoff lived, and we told them where Billy Stillman lived. And then they took off, and they went on their own and did their own business. Coldy pursues his search independently of the police. Gail Holotuck is a private investigator who specializes in the training and handling of search and rescue dogs. Dogs can be used in a number of ways to search for specific items that you train them for. They can be searched to find small articles. They can be searched to find live humans, to find human remains. And they can also be trained to search for bombs or drugs or anything specific you train them to find. The dogs are smelling the skin cells. You shed thousands and thousands of skin cells a second, and the dogs are picking up on the skin cells that are deposited on the clothing. And then while they're following you, those skin cells are in the air. If you have a dog that's got multidiscipline, then that's great because you can just have the dog do a general search and do what's called air scenting, and they'll just pattern through the area. You'll, you'll cordon off the area and you'll pattern through the area and see what the dog does, see how the dog reacts to any scent and, and follow the dog and it may lead you to an article of her clothing or it may lead you to the body. So if you don't know at that point if it's missing or not, the best sort of um, tactic would be imprint the dog with the scent of the person that's missing and start with that and see if they come up with any articles of clothing or, or find her. Tuesday in the afternoon, I got a call from my boss to go down to the Bischoff residence immediately. So I went over to the Bischoff residence, and Mr. Caldy had a sandwich bag, paper bag. In the bag was a crumpled up panties. They looked like they had been uh, outside for quite a while. They were dirty and, and, and full of dirt but the panties were pink with black polka dots. When I saw those panties right now, and I looked at the mother, and the mother was crying, and she says, I told you, I told you, she's dead, she's dead. Caldy has broken one of the fundamental rules of evidence handling in a forensic investigation. If it's the case of a homicide or, or something, um, if it's an article of evidence, then you mark it and you notify the authorities that you found something that may be associated to this missing person case. And they come in and, and conduct their investigation from there. By moving it, you're, you're going to hinder the police's investigation and, and possibly remove evidence, DNA evidence or something that would be on that article. Also would be very upsetting for the family for you to show up with that. I told them, please take me where you found these. And uh, they showed me where the panties were found. Colby leads Constable Blinn to a place under the Trans-Canada Highway Bridge that crosses the Oromocto River. The police had not examined this area because they had no witness statements or reasons to search there. You can't go 
from the train bridge to the other highway bridge uh, unless you go on on a main street in Oromocto. It's just it, it kind of the land the way the land is designed there's no way you can make it unless you go on the street so we never figured she'd be on the Trans Canada Highway underneath the Trans Canada Highway Bridge because there was no reason to be there it's not a direct path it's very secluded because there's nothing there it's a piece of land that follows the highway that stops at the river so we cordoned that off and and um, the river was right there, but it was already getting very late in the afternoon. The river was high, the ice had melted, it was very cold, the water, but um, the Oromocto River was, wasn't moving very fast because of the St. John River being very high, so it kind of backs this one up somewhat. Very, very low current at the time. The water level of the river had dropped by about one meter after flooding by the snow melt a few days earlier. Just before leaving the area, they find a running shoe on the riverbank. Gilblin recognizes that the shoe fits Gail Bischoff's description of what Pamela was wearing the night she disappeared. They actually probably just sunk right there and stayed right on the rocks. The RCMP continues to search under the bridge while Constable Patrick Cole investigates a burglary. I had other investigations on the go, and one of them was involving a break and enter that Billy Stone was a suspect in. So I arrested him for this break and enter. Constable Cole questions Billy Stillman at the police station. At the end of the interrogation, Cole takes the opportunity to ask him some questions about the disappearance of Pamela Bischoff. Stillman continues to deny any knowledge of it. Pat Cole then tells him that Pamela's underwear and running shoe were found near the Oromocto River. Billy Stillman's brother CJ and a friend are also suspects in the break and enter investigation. And I started interviewing his brother in relation to a bunch of break-ins and to vehicles. And while I was interviewing him, there was an emergency knock at the door. One of the members came to the door to say that there was an emergency phone call that I needed to take. And it was the guy that I just interviewed saying he just got home. And Billy went into the woods and left a note to say that he'd see us on the other side. They had a knife and that he was leaving his equipment to different people. Pat Cole interprets this as a suicide note. He pays a visit to C.J. Stillman's house. Do Billy Stillman's actions have something to do with the disappearance of Pamela? Will they find Stillman before it's too late? Pamela Bischoff disappeared after partying with a group of friends near the Oromocto River in New Brunswick. For several days, the police and the community are looking for the teenage girl. Underwear and a shoe belonging to Pamela were found in the river. Her body has not been located. Everyone fears the worst. Billy Stillman is now the prime suspect in Pamela's disappearance. But now, he has also disappeared, leaving a suicide note. I went to the residence where Billy was last at with his brother met with his friend, and they both, his brother and his friend, went into the woods. They went on their own because they felt that if he saw me, he might run. C.J. Stillman and his friend find Billy in tears, sitting on a pile of wood at the edge of a forest road. They take him home where Pat Cole awaits. And he was quite upset over people. At that time, were harassing him. And there was one kid in particular that was going to beat him up. Billy Stillman tells Constable Cole that since Pamela went missing, there are rumors that he has something to do with her disappearance. Then, suddenly, he said that Pamela had attempted suicide and that he tried to stop her, and then he left her alone. There was nothing to say. There was anything but a missing person at that time. Could the waters of the Oromocto River hold the key to the mystery of Pamela's disappearance? 
The next morning, the dive team sets out for the highway bridge at the Oromocto River. They set up their equipment and put on their wetsuits. They are ready to explore the waters of the river by mid-morning. The banks of the river are rocky. There is very little current. The water is dark and murky, and its temperature is barely above freezing. Constable Dan Desereau, part of the RCMP dive unit, is on the scene that day. The Oromocto River is uh, maybe 60 feet wide, and then uh, the riverbed must be 30 or 40 feet at its deepest. There's a rapid drop-off of about, I would say, a 45-degree slope. We entered the water right next to where the personal effects were found. They use a technique called a pendulum search. So they're on a row, and they start at one point, and then it's like a pendulum. It goes, you start here, and you go this way, and then you go this way, and then a little bit more rope, and you go this way, a little bit more rope, and you go that way. So with every pass from right to left or left to right, once you finish that, then you get a little bit more rope, and you keep doing the same thing. So we had a general idea where she could be. I myself discovered Miss Bischoff. She was dressed in dark clothes, and what drew my attention was her cheek, her left cheek, which was in the dark water and was very pale, and that really drew my attention. I was maybe only a few feet away when I saw this. Miss Bischoff was found, I would say, at about eight to 10 feet deep. She was in the fetal position, her face towards the rocks, as if she was floating above the rocks. So in order to get her out of there, we had to be very careful so that she would not get scratched up, and we needed to preserve as much evidence as possible. The Oromocto River did not keep its secret for very long. Investigators have finally found the victim. Now they need to determine what happened to Pamela and how her body got into the icy waters. When we pulled the remains out of the water, her jeans were three quarters up, zipper undone, not buckled, uh, no panties. Her shirt was pulled up. It looks as if the murderer tried to put Pamela's clothes back on her before throwing her body into the river. I uh, noticed that the female had some marks on her that would not have normally been there if she had just drowned in the river. Uh, there was marks that her eye was almost completely closed. As far as decomposition, there wasn't any because the water was cold. There was a lot of bruising. It was obvious she was beat up. So right, right from the onset, we knew it was a homicide. She was beat up bad. The facial area was swollen, bruised so on, you could tell that there was a struggle that took place. And she was, uh, she put up a good struggle. The water could have erased all the evidence of this crime, but it did not cooperate. Logic would lead you to believe that if you throw a body in the river, that the water's gonna take that body to wherever, and maybe perhaps to be never seen again. And that does happen. In occasionally in the St. John River. Don't forget, the Oromocto River feeds into the St. John River, which is quite a large river. And we had people go missing in the St. John River, which were never found again. So yeah, that could happen. And in his mind, he probably figured he was gonna throw in the river and that was gonna be the end of it. But that wasn't the case. The body was removed brought to the morgue in Fredericton, pronounced dead by a doctor. Uh, the coroner at the time, because it was a homicide, decided that we needed a forensic autopsy. Therefore, the body was moved to the morgue at the St. John Regional Hospital, where the autopsy was going to be performed the next morning. With the discovery of Pamela's body, the case changes from a missing person to a homicide investigation. The Oromocto RCMP do not have the resources to handle large cases. It is transferred to the Serious Crimes Unit of the RCMP in Fredericton. Corporal Joseph Hine, part of the Forensic Unit, 
conducts a detailed forensic search of the site. My task fell um, to search the scene where she was found, and there was a couple of other smaller scenes that became relevant after they were talking to people that I had to search too, and it involved doing a, a grid, um, fairly big grid, all under the bridge and up the bank beside it, and and that area along the river where she was found. Uh, you do a grid so you can identify where in the grid you find anything. And there was a, um, in the sand under the bridge, obvious that kids had been under the bridge. So we had to record all of that. Um, and then we just, we had military people there too, helping us search through the grids and didn't find anything of significance really. Pamela's father and sister go to the morgue to identify the body. They confirm the body is indeed Pamela. Although the cold water had prevented the body from decomposing, it also reveals some surprises. What will the autopsy uncover about Pamela Bischoff's murder? Pamela Bischoff's body is found in the ice-cold waters of the Oromocto River in New Brunswick. The teenager disappeared after a night of partying with friends. Billy Stillman, the last person to be seen with her, is the prime suspect. An autopsy is scheduled for the morning of April 19th to try to determine the cause of death. They will also look for evidence that might show the identity of the murderer. This water was like less than a degree Celsius. It was very, very cold. So it virtually refrigerated her. When the body gradually warms to room temperature, bruises that were invisible before become obvious. They indicate that the victim has been involved in a fight much more fierce than the police had originally imagined. The autopsy is conducted by Dr. Kellick. Joseph Hine is also present. Since the case has been taken over by the RCMP Major Crimes Unit, Gilles Blin's role in the investigation changes. My role as exhibit custodian, so any exhibits that are seized, blood samples, genetic material that's found on the remains, hair samples, uh, any evidence that's given to me, I, I bag it up, prepare it, send it to the labs, and do whatever that we have to do with that evidence to get some uh, analysis done. The findings of the autopsy was that she died from blunt force trauma to, to the skull, resulting in a brain being swelled and a herniation of the brain, which means the brain swelled up and was forced into the foramen magnum, which is the small hole in the back of your skull that your spinal cord goes through there. And the brain swelled up and it was pushed into there, and you could actually see that on the, on the photos. Uh, we knew she had died from head trauma. Uh, we also had to do a diatome test on her to prove that she did not drown. There was a pathologist at the Center for Forensic Science in Toronto, and he had developed a test he called the diatome test, which uh, he felt that if someone drowned, they aspirate water and they're struggling, their heart's beating fast, and, and that, that whole death struggle adrenaline and circulates a lot of blood through their body. So he had a test where he took the biggest bone in the body, the femur, from your leg, dissolve it in a centrifuge with hydrochloric acid, and diatoms are silica, so they don't dissolve in, in hydrochloric acid, and end up with samples of diatoms, single cell animals. And, and he was of the opinion that if you found those in bone marrow, it was evidence that someone drowned. Okay, And even further than that, um, diatoms tend to be area specific in a river. So you take water samples from the river and he compares the diatoms he finds to the samples. And in some cases, he might be able to say that the person drowned and they drowned in this stretch of river. The pathologist finds traces of semen from a vaginal swab, indicating that Pamela had sex the night of her death. DNA was in its infancy. The techniques that they employ today are light years ahead of the techniques that were employed then. And it took months to get the DNA results back. We knew we had semen 
And, but in order to link the semen to him to prove a sexual, a sexual assault took place, so we can lay a, a first degree murder charge, we need the dead DNA evidence. So it's, it's automatically first degree murder if a sexual assault took place and the victim ends up deceased. While we were performing the autopsy, I did observe a bite mark on her stomach. And we called Dr. Fenton Smith from Moncton, who's a forensic odontologist. That's their specialty is to deal with bite mark evidence. And that was done. And Dr. Smith showed up, you know, two or three hours later and, uh, and took care of that physical evidence there. Had to put moles, photographs, measurements, and so on. Bite marks are similar to what fingerprints are. They have to have certain points to identify. And Billy Stillman had a unique dentition. He was a small guy. He had small mouth. Several teeth were crooked, so you could actually see that on the bite mark itself. The forensic odontologist will be able to compare the molds made from the bite mark on the body of the victim with dental impressions made from the suspect. Investigators also decide to do another test on the area of skin where Pamela was bitten. The tissue, bite mark tissue, was, was excised and placed in formaldehyde, and I had that exhibit. I took it to Montreal to Dr. Dorian, who is another forensic odontologist, and he used a technique called trans-illumination. Essentially, is you take tissue and you place a strong light behind it, and you want to see if there's any bleeding in the tissues. The trans-illumination test can show whether Pamela was dead or still alive when she was bitten. If there was blood in the tiny vessels, it would indicate she was still alive. But the investigators have to wait a while before receiving the results. Just like Mrs. Bischoff said, the theory was Billy Stillman raped her and threw her in the river. What we didn't know is the sequence of events. When was she thrown in the river? Was she left? We know she was beat. Now, did she die underneath the bridge? And the next morning, he realized that he had killed her and then threw her in the river? Personally, that's what I believe, and I have no evidence to, to, to the contrary. That's just my personal belief. I believe he, maybe he didn't intend to kill her. The results was it, she's dead. And the next morning, he realized, after he got some phone calls from the Bischoff house saying, have you seen Pam? And then he says, why is she missing? And we have a young man matching his description run towards the river. And I believe that's probably when he realized he had killed her and panicked and wanted to get uh, rid of the evidence and placed her body in the river. The autopsy is complete. The police decide to question their primary suspect, Billy Stillman. On the 19th of April, Eden was at school. I got a call from the principal that there was problems at the school, so I went there, and I was going to speak to him at that time. When I got to the school, which was only minutes from my office, he had already left the area. I interviewed his brother again, and his brother made an effort to go and find him. He located Billy and brought him to our office, where he was arrested by myself. Constable Cole escorts Stillman to an interrogation room. Gilles Blinn monitors their conversation. As a result of the autopsy, I knew at the time that there was both semen found inside Pamela Bischoff, as well as teeth impressions on her body. Therefore, when I did the initial arrest of Billy Stillman, I did as an instant of arrest that I needed DNA samples being hair samples as well as teeth impressions. The lawyer advises Stillman to say nothing to the police and wrote a letter formally objecting to the seizure of DNA samples from his client. RCMP acknowledged the letter, but decide to proceed anyway. 
at the time that the, of the murder of Pamela Bischoff, there was no legislation in place to authorize us to take any of these samples. But we decided that we needed to get these samples. The police decide to go to the RCMP station in Fredericton, about a 15 minute drive, where there are facilities and equipment to take samples. At that time, was some samples were taken from him from his hair, pubic area, and bite marks were placed into a mold, a plastic mold. After the samples are taken, Patrick Cole questions the suspect. I went in to talk to Billy Stillman. I interviewed him, talked to him for an hour. During the conversation, he had his head down. He was uh, cutting himself by his uh, index finger, rubbing against the thumb of his hand. He was bleeding. He kept wiping it on a pair of jeans. He never answered one word, never spoke one word the whole time. He was very distressed. and. He never lifted his head up once until one hour when he said he wanted to give a statement and he wanted to call his lawyer first. Will the DNA samples from Billy Steelman match the semen sample found in the victim during the autopsy? An autopsy on the body of Pamela Bischoff reveals traces of semen in her vagina. Samples are sent to the laboratory for DNA analysis. The police also collect DNA samples of the primary suspect, Billy Stillman, for comparison. During a police interrogation, Stillman says he wants to talk to his lawyer before making a statement. After he called his lawyer, he said he needed to use the washroom. I brought him to the washroom, he used the washroom, and as we were leaving, he blew his nose into a paper towel and threw the paper towel into the, the garbage receptacle. The bin itself was, there was a new plastic bag in there because the cleaning crew had gone through just earlier and it was after hours. So I managed to get Billy secured, went back and retrieved the, the paper towel. Well, from my years of experience, I knew that anything discarded could be used as evidence and I knew at that time that DNA could be found from mucus dry cells, anything like this, so it was worth taking a chance with it. Will Constable Cole's instincts pay off? Unfortunately, when the interrogation resumes, Stillman refuses to reveal anything. We interviewed him a little bit more longer. We didn't have enough evidence at that time to be able to say that he was involved in the actual murder of Pamela Bischoff. Then we had a briefing with our heads at the headquarters and they decided that the charges that I had against Billy Stillman for other matters were to be brought forward and we were gonna to try to hold him on those matters. Billy Stillman is kept in custody, charged with break and entering. His bail hearing takes place a few days later. He was released on his own recognizance and after he pled guilty to the matter, other matters, he was sentenced to a group home. So he was held at a group home, so he knew where we, he was. Police searched Stillman's residence for clues and other possible sources of DNA. A series of items, including clothes and shoes, are seized. No articles revealed anything of any significance once they were analyzed. His clothes were washed uh, after he showed up home that night. Apparently, he washed his clothes. That's what the people living there told us. So if there was any trace evidence left on the clothing, potentially be gone after he washed it. This time, water was the perfect accomplice and washed away the possible evidence. There wasn't much more being done because the bulk of the evidence was going to be the DNA. So we were just waiting for the DNA at that time to come back. The police receive the results of the transillumination test. There is no blood in the skin around the bite, which means that she was dead or near death when she was bitten. If the bite mark coincides with Stillman's dental impression, it will indicate that he was on the scene when Pamela died. 
It took until the end of November before we received the report of the DNA samples we had sent out for analysis. And it showed that Billy Stillman, in particular the semen sample, was a match to what we had sent in. And there was uh, one in 16 billion chances of him not being that donor. His lawyer actually went down to the group home and brought him to us. And I rearrested him again for the murder of Pamela Bischoff. And again, as an incident of arrest, for the second time I asked him for hair samples as well as teeth impressions. And at this time it was against his wishes, but we told him we know it's, it was against his wish, but we were going to do it, and that could be brought up at court. Although Stillman is only 17 years old at the time of the crime, he is tried as an adult. In 1993, during a first trial, he is convicted of murder by the Provincial Court of New Brunswick. He appeals the verdict, challenging that the DNA samples were taken against his will. Graham Sleeth is one of the lawyers for the prosecution at the trial. The outcome of that was that our provincial court, our provincial appellate court, was to be was prepared to accept the reception of materials, even though they felt there had been a violation of the rights of the accused. Due in part to this case, the law is changed to allow investigators to collect biological samples for DNA analysis. As a result of this case law, now the police can get if you think there's genetic material to be had and it would benefit your case, you gotta apply for a search warrant and you get it based on your information to a judge and then you can seize that material. Unsatisfied with the result from the Provincial Appeals Court, Stillman and his lawyers present a second appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada ultimately, while clearly seeing the viability of DNA evidence and its importance, held the acquisition of the samples that had been used against young Stillman was improper, unacceptable, and as a result, inadmissible. When the, the case was thrown out, there was a lot of us in the police community that were pretty upset. Not only were we upset because it was thrown out for, let's say, for, for a legal loophole, you know, you had to think about the family as well because they had to endure another trial all the DNA evidence, except for the paper towel containing the mucus, everything else was thrown out. That that was the only piece of evidence we were allowed to keep as evidence. The teeth impressions, the hair samples were all discarded. We were not allowed to use them. Constable Cole's instinct to collect the paper towel from the trash has indeed been correct. The prosecution can use the DNA profile as evidence. Six years after the murder of Pamela Bischoff, the Supreme Court orders a second trial. And because of that, a warrant was drawn up, and we attempted to get samples. And at this time, he had a new lawyer who refused to let us even speak to him. And uh, every time we tried to get samples from him, he just closed his mouth and wouldn't allow the samples to be taken. Therefore, we went to the higher court and asked that any evidence that we had before be used against them. Given that Billy Stillman refused to cooperate, the judge allows the Crown to use DNA samples and dental impressions they had collected and analyzed in 1991. Billy Stillman's second trial ends with a conviction of second-degree murder. Because he was a juvenile at the time of the murder, Stillman is sentenced to eight years in prison, the maximum penalty under Canadian law. Today, largely because of the controversy over DNA evidence in the Pamela Bischoff case, the police have the ability to obtain a warrant to collect bodily samples from a suspect. But the mystery still hangs over what really happened on the night of April 12, 1991. There was no witnesses. One doesn't talk and the other one is deceased to the actual events of that evening on the Friday night of April 12th, 1991. There's only two people that were there underneath that bridge. And we'll never know to this day unless he decides to tell us what happened. 
the waters of the Oromocto River revealed the victim's body. But how she was murdered remains a mystery, and Billy Stillman holds the key.